Today, we are going to talk to David Karabi. David is a best-selling author and also a very famous podcaster. He has a long-time podcast, more than almost six years, uh, that name is Love Your Work. So I really recommend you to listen to him and to accompany with this new episode about mind management and the importance of managing well our minds and not being very worried about our time management, but more with our mind management. Let's talk to David. Thank you. Welcome to our podcast, David. Dolores, thank you for having me. It's an honor. Thank you for your time. Do you like to uh, tell us more about what you are doing? Sure. Yeah, I'm doing well. Um, what I'm doing? Well, I have uh, recently launched a book called Mind Management, Not Time Management. You can see it over my shoulder if you're watching on, on the, uh, the video. And so I have spent the last several years rethinking the way that we think about how we get things done. Um, and I realized that this paradigm of time management, of thinking that what we put in in time is what we're going to get out in output is, is very flawed. And it's especially flawed when it comes to thinking creatively. And um, I moved to South America. I'm from the United States. I moved to South America, completely redesigned my life around creativity, around uh, trying to find the right mental state uh, through which to do creative work. I think Constantine Brancusi, the sculptor, said it very well. Things are not difficult mm -hmm. to make. What is difficult is putting ourselves in the state of mind to make them. So I did that exploration for several years. I've shared that uh, in this new book. Yes, I love your latest book and also your podcast, Love Your Work, that it's already five years podcast, right? You've been running the podcast. For yeah, a I'm about five, five, maybe five and a half years, yes. probably right around five and a half years right now that I've had that podcast, Love Your Work. And I've done a lot of uh, exploration on that. And I continue to do a lot of exploration on that. And along the way, I have talked to uh, a number of wonderful entrepreneurs and creators on there, people like mm. Seth Godin and, and David Allen, uh, Joanna Penn, lots of wonderful people. Yes, I love it. And the power of the words, because the title, Love Your Work, I mean, it's amazing, the title that you chose to have for the podcast. Love well, I feel like work. it's a message for myself. Mm. It's kind of a message for myself to remind myself to, to, to find that space where I enjoy what it is that I'm doing, um, but I don't forget that It, it's work that it's not always going to be um, uh, it's not always going to be easy. Uh, passion isn't enough to get you through everything, but yes. if you uh, put in the time, uh, you can find that satisfaction. And that's what I get up and try to do every day. Yes. And you also um, emphasize the importance of creating and not, not always like consuming or Uh, spending time like looking for that inspiration but taking the time to make it I mean to make practice and and create your own work or your own piece of art well yeah there's no end to the amount of content that you can consume you know you could go mm -hmm. consume my podcast if you wanted to uh, I would recommend that you don't do that I would mm -hmm. recommend that you create something instead anytime that you think about, oh, what am I going to consume right now? Now, you probably will end up consuming some things, um, but it's very easy to get into that state where you're constantly looking for somebody to give you some sort of secret answer to how to succeed uh, doing creative work. And really, there's no better answer than to actually go and do it. 
Yes, I love that, that episode where you said, uh, stop listening to that. No, don't listen to my podcast. Go and, and do your own work. <laughs> it was amazing. You don't need to listen to my podcast. No, yes, we do you because it's like an inspiration. Go and do it and you don't need permission. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and also when you interviewed Seth Godin, uh, what he says, like discover your own calling. Do you think that you have discovered your calling yourself? Well, I think I'm, it's, a, I think it's a process. It's an ongoing process changes all the time. You know, I, I, mm. every time I finish a project, I, it's this sort of catharsis where all of this potential, I talked about this in my other book, the heart to start that as you go through life, as you have your experiences, this sort of potential energy builds up inside of you. And when you create something, that is the release of, of that energy. Almost like if you took a ball and you bounce it on the floor, you know, you're, you're creating that energy in the way that it compacts against the floor and it bounces. You know, the way that we interact with the world creates that bounce. And so when you do deliver something into the world, something new, well, then you've got to wait for that potential energy to, to build up again. I guess if I were to choose my calling, it would be the pursuit of allowing that potential energy to build up and then releasing it with some, some new work all the time. What form that takes, uh, it varies. It like, it's like depending like on, the, on the attitude that you choose to, to follow or on the state of your own, like say, mind or your own uh, period of life or what, what it depends on? I mean, it could be, it could be any subject. It could be almost any medium. I mean, I have settled mostly in on, on books. I personally love to read books myself. Uh, and I have my podcast as well. I listen to a lot of podcasts, yes. but that doesn't mean that I couldn't end up creating something in some other form. I have courses here and there. I've done talks and speeches and and i've done a book on design I've done a book on um, yes. sort of starting creativity i've done and now, now this book on mind management not time management um and i've you know privately been dabbling in fiction and other various projects that uh mm -hmm. you know i i remain open to to whatever uh, wherever my curiosity might take me next Great. Uh, regarding that part of uh, your um, second book, The Heart to Start, where you talk about the cultural uh, differences and how they affect us, literally that part when you, say, when you said, um, what do Elvis Presley, the Impressionist painters and Harry Potter have in common? Yes, they are all cultural sensations that came out of big ideas. But almost every big idea does the same thing. Big ideas tap into the collective consciousness. Fortunately, your own consciousness is part of the collective consciousness. I love that part. <laughs> so did you want me to talk about that part? <laughs> yes, because for me, uh, like as a translation, translator like cultural and localization and different uh, way because it's as you know it's the same Spanish but the Spanish in well that's different but let's talk about the, that part of your book that it sure. really impacted me yeah so cultural consciousness I think we're all going through the world having our experiences there's events happening and we're all having thoughts and what happens when a piece of work really resonates with us If it's a comedian who tells a joke, you often hear, oh, I thought that so many times. I just never put that into words. You look at book reviews. People say, oh, I love how this book really reinforced a lot of the things that I was kind of already thinking about. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at any YouTube video for any song. It could be your least favorite song in the world. And there are people out there who say, This song resonates so much with me because whatever reason. But there's only so much, so many opportunities there are to tap into that as things change. And there's usually this sort of 
uh, tension uh, between what is on people's minds and sort of the status quo, what people are saying. Actually, Seth Godin calls this in a, in a great book that I recommend very much, Unleashing the Idea Virus, he calls this kind of a, a vacuum. You know, there, that tension gets created and it creates this vacuum. Well, as soon as that vacuum gets punctured, then all that suction just mm -hmm. rushes the air out from around everything and, and, and creates this sort of explosion or, of interest in whatever this topic is. And uh, it's the, the, the way to create a sensation like that, I think, and this is something that I'm always trying to remind myself of, is to listen to this voice in your head, that you're having those thoughts. Like if somebody, if, it, if this is happening to you all the time, where you something resonates with you and you think, oh, that's exactly what, what I, I thought was. or what I felt, well, you could have been that person. <laughs> if you already thought or felt it, then you could have been the one who said it. So if you're somebody, if you're in the business of creating things, you need to constantly be listening to that voice. You need to not be telling it that it's wrong, but you need to be listening to that voice to, to write those things down, to explore those thoughts further, to try to generate, put them into something that will resonate with somebody. Do you think that perhaps we don't uh, make that time to just listen to our own voices or? Oh, we certainly don't. We don't. Yeah, we certainly <laughs> don't. Um, yeah. We certainly don't, but then also it's, it's kind of happening, but we also, a lot of us have sort of shame around uh, writing down our thoughts or our feelings. We kind of worry that, oh, it's weird. Somebody's going to judge me about this. I'm afraid that I'm going to say something that I don't mean and hurt somebody. Uh, and you don't, it doesn't always have to be public. You know, you can, you can, uh, you can do what uh, 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 this psychologist, um, uh, Dr. Aziz, he's got a, a, a book that I really like called not nice, where he talks about having a shadow journal, which is basically, mm. you're just a place where you write all your thoughts, you know, even if they're like, bad and oh, because you don't even necessarily mean it and, and you know you can destroy it or i, I have what i a little um alpha smart it's a little portable word processor i can write things on there and delete them and later on decide yeah well, I, did i really do i think this or do i think that etc it doesn't have to be mm. in public but if you give yourself the the opportunity to explore those thoughts every once in a while something comes out that uh, really does affect somebody in, in a positive way. Um, and it does take some courage that way. If you're gonna be the first to say something that everybody's thinking, well, that's, that, that's a, a hard thing to do. I'm not the best at that myself. I, that's why I wrote uh, that book and, and wrote that chapter to remind myself to constantly be thinking like, wait, I just thought something every time, anytime you, you see something you're, and you're, and you're like, huh, why is that like that? Or that's silly. Why do they do it that way? Like capture mm -hmm. it, write it down, explore that thought. Maybe there's something there. You might have some sort of observation there that can, that can resonate with people in some way. Yes. Amazing. And also what you also recommend is to do not like be a multitasker because sometimes our minds are like, trying to do so many things at the same time and there's no no anything good comes out of that well if you're trying to multitask and you're trying to do anything that's cognitively challenging something that requires a lot of thought you're not really multitasking most of the time you're doing this thing and then you're stopping <laughs> doing that thing and then you're switching to that thing and then you're doing that thing and you're stopping doing that thing and then you're switching so there's all these switching costs going on. It's not really that useful. I mean, there's certain contexts where multitasking can be helpful, such as listening to a podcast while you sweep the floor, for example. Mm -hmm. um, that, can be, that can be useful. But uh, even beyond not multitasking, having space, uh, creating space for reverie. If you're going for creativity, if you want to be somebody who has 
great ideas. And that's what, and ideas are more and more important than ever in this world of extremely high leverage where, mm. look at this, I'm in Colombia, you're in Argentina, we are publishing this conversation, thousands of people around the world could watch and listen to this. Any, every, the whole world could watch and listen to this um, yes. if it was an, enough of an impact. And so what's the difference? The difference is the quality of the ideas. It's not about how, who has the distribution so, so much anymore. It's a very high leverage world. And because of that, that really changes the way that we have to think about, am I being productive in, in, in what I'm doing? Because if you're stacking bricks on a wall, uh, there's not a lot of ways to get leverage with that. You got to put down a brick. You got to put down another brick. You got to put down another brick. That's the work that you're doing. But if writing a good blog post that reaches a million people or a blog post that flops requires the same amount of effort, and sometimes it does, well, then it's really all about the idea. So if you are looking for creativity, then you do want to create that space. I, I recently tried a little challenge myself. Um, I based, based on a, a challenge by a, a investor, Naval Ravikant, I meditated for 60 hours in 60 days, an hour a day. I ended up doing 90 oh, days, yeah. or sorry, I ended up doing 89 days in a row. I quit on purpose because I didn't want to, didn't want to make it about oh, the street. I wanted it to make it about you know, creating that space. And it was really a revelation because I started to realize that there were a lot of thoughts that, would, that I would have allowed to pass me by if I were busy doing something else. But because I was sitting and letting my thoughts flow for 60 minutes a day, it had a couple of effects. One effect was that I started to think about those thoughts that were kind of things that I would have dismissed as crazy ideas that I would have said, oh, yeah, I, I don't have time for that. I can't do that. So I, that happened. And then also I had more time to think about the things that I was going to do. So when I finally was actively doing things, I was doing things quicker, better quality, more crisp. And, uh, and also those ideas that I was thinking about that were kind of the crazy ideas that I wouldn't have pursued started to take on a lot more presence in my mind and as a result, those turned into things that I decided I wanted to do. Um, and so it's, it's been very useful. I can't point to it yet and say that there's been a huge result from that, but I can point to something similar that I did uh, several years ago, which was, actually I think it was in 2012, I took what I call a week of want. This is where I clear mm -hmm. everything I can off my schedule and create space. And that space, with that space, I want to explore what I'm curious about. What do I want to do? Not what do I have to do? What do I want to do? What do I, what am I gonna love to do, right? Love your work. Yes, love. And through that process, I ended up writing a blog post. And that blog post eventually prompted uh, Dan Ariely, who's a behavioral scientist, to reach out yeah. to me. He was working on a productivity app. Uh, called Timeful. I served as advisor to that app and uh, helped integrate some of what I wrote about in that post uh, into an app. Google bought that app. Yeah. I had a surprise payday from that a few a few years after my week of want. And, uh, and then I recently published this book, Mind Management, Not Time Management, which was the name of that blog post that I wrote, what, eight, nine, nine years, years ago. ago. And so it takes time, especially when you're trying to find those bigger ideas that are, that are yeah. rooted in your soul. It takes a lot of time to allow those things to, to gestate and be ready uh, to, to bring into the world and, and, and also to see how those things are going to finally work out. Yes. And right now, at this moment in the whole world, I mean, we are living or going through like a pandemic and the idea of mind management that it's so appropriate I mean it's the ideal time I mean it's like perfect because we we really need that to manage our time not time but our minds 
you know, a lot of us are starting to have a little more control over our time uh, mm -hmm. than we use without somebody watching over our shoulder at an office mm -hmm. or something like that. And we have to be able to get into that state to be able to do the sort of creative thinking that is more and more important um, as we tumble into the future. Yes, and the the importance of um, create being creative, as you said, like in the e ER or not ER era, let's say of artificial intelligence and automation and all that. How important it is for everyone to be creative? Because some people think, well, I'm not an artist, I'm not a creator, you know, I don't have that talent. Well, it doesn't necessarily have to be creating something. Uh, no. So what, what I'm saying, uh, as I mentioned, it being this age of leverage, um, mm. which actually is what David, per the name of D David Perel's site, uh, there's, mm -hmm. it's a high leverage world that we live in where, you know, I think uh, Naval Ravikant actually pointed this out, the, the Warren Buffett, this, this well-known investor, you know, one of the richest people yeah. on earth, he spends... A, a year, maybe longer, deciding, and a day acting. A year making this decision, is this the company that I want to invest in? Acting, how long does it take to buy that company? But there's leverage there. There's a lot of, <laughs> yeah. there's a lot of money. And, and it's, it's through that, those high leverage activities that he's able to create a huge impact through less actual, like, sitting and doing work. And as we're in this age where computers can do so many things for us, AI is starting to be able to do many more things for us. Well, what, what can it do? Well, one thing that it can do is uh, it can generate 50,000 words faster than you can blink. How long would it take you to type 50,000 words? Uh, you know, maybe a day, but you could write a novel in a month. People do it all the time, NaNoWriMo. They write 50,000 mm -hmm. word novel in a month and some of them are pretty good. Now, when they try to get a, a computer to write a novel, it doesn't necessarily take that long once you've got the algorithm written, but the novels aren't very good. <laughs> so your edge as a human is not like, how fast can I do this thing? Your edge as a human is thinking the thoughts behind the actions. And so creativity is one element of that, but it can be decision-making, learning, like just being able to decide how you're going to act. And the one way to decide how you're going to act is through that process of creation. Creation, yes. And what what's for you or what does attitude means for you? Does it really impact also the way we we work or we think or not? Attitude. It's very subjective right? or yes, our own attitudes. You know, some people wake up every morning, okay, yeah. with uh, optimistic or with, okay, a new day, a new beginning. And some people just wake up, oh, another day. You know, mm -hmm. like so many difficulties. The world is um, so complicated, uh, this pandemic, uh, the struggles, yeah. economic issues, so many things, you know. <laughs> I think it's a balance. You... you um... You know, I sometimes you feel like the world is acting upon you and there's nothing that you can do about it. And some people are perpetually in that state. And mm. sometimes you get bad breaks and it's really like that. Uh, but it's ultimately probably not. Uh, you have some control over things and you try to your best to get the control you can over those things with the acceptance that you can't control everything. That stuff is going to mm -hmm. happen that you can't, anything about and that's where i'm trying to yes and as much as i as much as i can it's like okay this this thing happened what i had this other plan <laughs> that's not going to happen well what can i do with what is happening so that's the attitude i try to take awesome and also uh, the power of habits like for example your 100 words a day habit of writing. I mean, I think you are a big believer on the power of habits in our own lives. Yeah. So I have this free email course. 
It's the is called the hundred word writing habit. It's at a hundred one hundred the number one hundred wordwritinghabit.com. And it's a free email course. Starts uh, a new session starts every week, and it's all about how to build, as the name would imply, a hundred word writing habit. Now, a lot of people hear this idea of writing of a hundred word writing habit, and they think, well, what's the point in that? You can't really do very much writing a hundred words a day. Well, what most people do when they try to build a writing habit is they try to build a habit to write a thousand words a day, and then what happens? They write a thousand words. The next day they write a thousand words. The next day they don't, and then mm -hmm. it's over, and that's it. But when you tell yourself you're going to write a hundred words a day, it's a totally different experience because you're like, well, it's ridiculous. I can write a hundred words. It doesn't take very long. It really doesn't take very long. But you do it. You pat yourself on the back, and you you set it up to do it the next day, and then you do it the next day, and you keep that up. And it's one of these things, I call it motivational judo, where you set up this goal for yourself that's so easy that you can't possibly fail at it. You, it, it it's so, that, that there's almost like you can, it's easier to make an excuse that you can't write a thousand words than it is to make it an excuse that you can't write a hundred words. But what often happens is that once you've gotten to that hundred words, I mean, a hundred words a day, you can actually do quite a bit with. If, if you do write a hundred words a day and they, you know, went one after another and fit together, which they don't always, but they often do. You would have a novella every year. How many novellas have you written in how many years at this point? A lot of people, zero. Well, but if, even if you get, you know, you write that hundred words and, and you allow yourself to go over that hundred words, if you feel like it, you often do feel like it. You didn't feel like it before you started writing the hundred words. But now you've got to 100 words. Um, maybe you'll do 200. Maybe you do 500. You know, yeah. try not to do too many because it's really just feel good that you did 100. So that's kind of the gist of that course. But if people want um, some encouragement over a couple of weeks, uh, then I would encourage them to. I would encourage them to sign up at 100wordwritinghabit.com. Yes, it's amazing. I will write everything on the notes. I'm I'm doing it, by the way. Oh, great. And I thought, well, Thank okay, you. 100 words a day, but you have to make the commitment because sometimes, you, as you said, excuses are everywhere, but it's easy to commit to that because it's like five minutes, 10 minutes. I mean, you just have to write. And most of us are writing 100 words a day anyway, really. <laughs> oh, well. But emails, text messages, yes, tweets, exactly. right? For that. It's happening anyway. <laughs> yes. So I love that challenge. And I think that it's a very good like inspiration and habit to begin writing. So thank you for that, David. And thank you for your Thanks podcast, for, for your books. Yes, I, everyone can sign up just on the, I will write the, the link on the notes. And for your podcast and your latest books and everything that you create, you are really an inspiration for, for all of us, for all the world. Oh, that's wonderful, Dolores. Thank you, thank you so much. It's been an honor being and on your show. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And also, you are also a, a prolific writer on Medium as well. You are I writing. publish there occasionally. Probably the best place to, uh, to see my writing is at if you just type in your smartphone, kdv.co nice short yes. URL that'll take you to where you can uh, see all the things I write. Because you continue writing apart from your books. I mean, you are every day writing, right? Yeah. Thank you. Keep on doing that. <laughs> Thank you, David. Thanks for your time, for your inspiration. And I will write also your social media and everything for people to, well, the ones who are not following you yet to follow you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, David. Well, hope you like this episode and you may also read and subscribe to David's newsletter, to David's challenges. Follow David on his social media and try to commit yourself to tiny habits that may improve your productivity your mind management and the future of your own work. 
and also listening to his podcast and perhaps creating your own. Thank you for listening.